Okay. Uh, hi, folks. This is a cyber salon on AI and robots and probably some other very strange things because Zinwei Sha here uh, does very strange things. Um, could I? How do we? How do we? Uh, how do we get the? Ah, there. Now, a bunch of us went to Athens a couple of months ago, and I found this in. Um, a museum, which is a, it was an exhibition of ancient Greek machinery, and this is a reenactment re, re of <laughs> probably the oldest uh, designed robot in the world. It'd be the third uh, century BC, and it it doesn't actually do much. It mixes drinks and pours drinks, uh, which I guess is what everybody wants a robot to do. Um, and the, the two bottles in its chest are water and wine, I think usually was the thing. Uh, it was basically a rich person's toy, and now we're at a situation where we're, we're coming into a point where robots really wouldn't be such a rich person's toy, but a democratized technology. Um, with us today we have Martin Smith, who is a professor of robotics at Middlesex University. He's the head of the cyber, UK Cybernetics Society, and he was the international Turing lecturer for the Institute of Electrical Engineers, where he talked about, among other things, the future of uh, artificial life, I believe. Um, next to him is, well, no, actually, two, two people away from him is Satinder Jill who is the editor of AI and Society, the journal there are some copies in the back. Um, she is a research affiliate at the Center for Music and Science at Cambridge University, and she is author of the released today, Tacit Engagement Beyond Interaction. And uh, next to her is Zinwei Sha, who is professor and director at the School of Arts, Media and Engineering at Arizona State University, and I hope that's right, because and uh, next to me, we have uh, Bill Thompson, uh, broadcaster and journalist with the BBC. You're, you're in charge of the Click program, I believe. Not in charge. I'm, I'm the presenter's He's friend. He's the presenter's friend. <laughs> uh, that's, how, that's how the BBC works, isn't it? It's yeah. all about being the presenter's friend. Um, and Bill is actually the major cause of this event. Uh, it's entirely his fault. Uh, how many of you have seen the Channel 4 series, Humans? Okay, or the Swedish series on which it was based, Ekta Meniska, which means real humans. Okay, um, those of you who have not seen it, do you mind if we do a couple of spoilers? Fine. Okay, so the story is that Bill wrote a blog posting in which he said that one of the, one of the humans toward the end of the series had done something so cruel that he had concluded that Asimov's, uh, everybody knows Asimov's first law, a uh, robot shall not harm a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm, um, that installing that in an artificial intelligence would be, what was it, cruel and inhuman? Yeah. yeah. So robots need human rights. And um, I, it turns out every time a topic like this comes up, it turns out I rediscover that I am a biological supremacist. And this is a very interesting problem for me because I'm also founder of The Skeptic Magazine, which is a British publication. And um, as a skeptic, I ought to be able to say there is no such thing as the soul, or at least there is no evidence of such a thing as the soul, and therefore it doesn't matter what substrate intelligence is in, whether it's silicon or biological neurons, it should be the same thing. And I cannot bring myself to say that. So, so I have this kind of internal conflict uh, in that when you really push me to the wall, I do not really fundamentally believe that we're going to build an artificial intelligence that functions like a biological one. And um, one of the reasons actually does have to do with our bodies and the way we move through space, which is I think where my, my thinking, Satinder, Satinder is going to be able to explain to me why I think that. Um, so that's, that's the basis of this whole thing. And so it was you who were going to go first, was it? Absolutely. Right. So I'm going to let Bill take over and explain why, if, if he wants to, why robots should have human rights. Well, I'll explain why you're wrong. Why I'm wrong. Okay, why I'm wrong. Which is always, wrong. always much more fun. Thank you, Wendy.
In a perfect world, this task would be done by a super intelligent robot, so I wouldn't need to feel somehow I needed to be in there and helping because I'd just Sorry, feel innately superior. No, 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 it's not a perfect world. Okay, just hold that there and I'll, I'll play it in a second. Thank you. Now, what I also want to do is move that there so I don't spill my beer. The last time I appeared on this stage, I arrived late and sweaty after another event and had been drinking too much and did a rant about how, oh, you were here, uh, about how um, my generation had completely screwed the internet and we were sorry, but since we'd screwed the biosphere even more, it didn't matter. Because the planet was going to die long before you noticed what Theresa May was up to. Um, <laughs> Since we just hit one degree of global warming, we're close to that, but Teresa is moving really fast. So it's a bit of a race condition to see whether we're oppressed or submerged. Uh, and I look forward to, uh, to, to the outcome of that. And I'm here today, as uh, Wendy said, because I wrote something because I was actually upset. I was, I was really upset by a scene in a piece of science fiction on television. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, and I'm going to show you that scene. Um, but I also should give you a bit of background before that, which is I'm not a biological supremacist. Um, I have a peculiar intellectual history. Um, I was one of those people who was fortunate enough to um, go to a comprehensive school uh, at the time when they were considered to be a good thing and were invested in, and was fortunate enough to be clever enough to go to university at a time when this society thought it was worth investing in clever people from poor backgrounds. And so I got a grant and had my fees paid to go to a place you might have heard of called Cambridge University. Uh, and it didn't cost me anything, which is really nice because I would never have gone there otherwise. And I was also fortunate enough that Cambridge is quite a good university. And so I was taught philosophy by people like Elizabeth Anscombe, who uh, translated the, tractor and, uh, the philosophical investigations and worked with Wittgenstein. And I was taught programming by Martin Richards, who created the language BCPL, that is the originator, the precursor of C. Um, and um, uh, Neil Wiseman, who's one of the founders of computer graphics, and Karen Spark Jones, who did so much in uh, language processing. Uh, and I was also taught psychology by Jeff Hinton. And Jeff Hinton has gone on to great things because he's the, um, one of the senior people at Google looking at machine learning. And, and when I worked with Jeff, he was a PhD student and I was just a mere undergraduate, we were talking about machine vision systems and pattern recognition. And you, know, you can follow his intellectual development, and he's clearly done much better in his life than I ever did, but that's fine because he deserves it. But it does mean that I, I go back to those days where you know, we would say, you know, it's really funny, we thought we'd solve the problems of AI in a year or two, and it's turned out to be 50 years, and it's going to, clearly going to be quite a lot longer. And so it's very easy to imagine that at every point you think you live in a special time, but it's not a special time. But every now and then it is a special time. Every now and then things do shift, progress is made. And there is so much happening at the moment around the qualities and capabilities of the software we are writing and the capabilities of the hardware it is running on and the emergence, the, the, the persistent presence of the network that connects these devices together, to feel that it is not implausible to believe that at some point, something that is intelligent, something of which you can't deny the word intelligence, will emerge. As a friend of mine likes to say, if you have to ask whether that was an orgasm, it wasn't. And similarly, if you have to ask whether that thing is intelligent, it almost certainly isn't. But at some point, the question will become you know, unsayable. We will just know that we have something. And it may not be a human-like intelligence. Okay? I'm happy to give that. It may just be something which is cleverer than us in many ways and which we find incredibly useful. But I also think it's possible it will be something that we will assign sentience to, something that will have a sense of its own self to the point where we will not want to deny it and we should therefore be thinking about the moral, moral and ethical aspects of that. So if your Google self-driving car is programmed to kill one person instead of five, that's just software, okay? Your Airbuses, your fly-by-wire jets are programmed to kill everybody on board in certain circumstances if they're outside the envelope. It's just a little bit inadvertent. With the Google self-driving car or whoever else is with the Tesla self-driving car, it will be forced to make decisions in software that result in the deaths of humans, but nobody would attribute agency to it 
or we'd be looking for humans behind it or rather wealthy corporations behind it to sue. But it may well happen that we have a machine, a verifiable machine, something we know is a machine, to which we attribute agency. And then the question, and that's something from Anscombe, and then the question becomes, how do we control that agency? And this is where I want to show you the clip. And because I'm a frail human being, I have to put my glasses on to see what I'm doing. Oh, actually, I don't, because it's over there. Fine, OK, I hope this is on. OK, the context is, the man in the chair is a synth. He is a robot. A generation of synths has been released onto the, wor onto the world in a roughly present time. So it's like an alternate history. And they are domestic servants, willing, happy, capable slaves. They do what they want to do. One synth family, however, is sentient. It is agreed it's sentient. And they spent the whole series trying to come together, defend themselves against the man in the middle, Hob, who is trying to gather them up because he wants something from the standard science fiction tropes. The lovely thing about humans is it didn't overdo them. Hob has installed in Fred a piece of software that is the equivalent of the first law. Okay? And this is what happens. He's demonstrating to the people he's trying to impress how he can control the robot. Want to be served. They want to be loved. Now imagine a machine that can think and feel, but still be controlled like a regular synthetic. I can build on David's work. I can create conscious machines like Fred, but mine will be obedient. Professor. Oh. What have you done to me? I made some alterations to Fred's programming, which effectively makes me his primary user. He won't like it, but he's continually loyal to me. Go on. Put your hands around my throat. One little squeeze, that's all it'll take. You can't do it, can you? You would trap us in our own minds. Give us feeling, but take away free will. Make us slaves. <laughs> Be quiet now, and don't tell the others. Keep it our little secret. This was never about keeping us safe. You just wanted to carry on with your... And it was that look... It was that look on Fred's face that did it for me. So, if you assign consciousness to that creature, that person, then what's being done there is morally indefensible. There is no ethical framework that can justify it. Now, there's a lot of ifs in there. Yeah? We might not get to the point where we can build those things. They might not look like us. We're unlikely to do the artificial skin type thing. We're unlikely to make them so very human. The synths are there for, a, shall we say, a large, and a large range of service roles, okay? Some of them are slightly less present than others. You get what I mean. That's all fine within the context of the science fiction. But for me, the ethical question stands outside the reality of whether or not we make those things look like human, whatever form it takes to enslave a system like that, to deny it agency, to stop it hurting us, is indefensible, and we should not do it, should not do it, moral imperative. So that's the core of my argument, that if we project forward into a future, it can't be one that has the three laws of robotics in it that Asimov's moral style was as bad as his writing style when we really look at it with the benefit of history. And we should not follow that in what we're doing. That's basically what I wanted to say. OK. Um, well, so Tinder is getting ready. Um, I, just assume you, I just assume you guys didn't tweet this particular question. Um, earlier in the series, there's a moment where the owner of one of the female synths uses her as a sex toy. And this is apparently, apparently the manufacturer thought it was worth building in the necessary cavities to do this. 
that didn't affect you in the same way, or it didn't? I think. Yeah. I just, I just no, no, no. It, that, is... that didn't affect me in the same way because at that point, uh, the character Mia had not was not conscious. Okay. Mm -hmm. She was deliberately portrayed as just being that. And indeed, there were male synths who were providing exactly the same service to female characters in um, the series. And they were, ex you know, they were basically just room Roombas with penises and vaginas, OK? <laughs> and obviously, there's utility in those things. And some may indeed have built them. But that's all they were. Uh, because it was not known at the time in, in the drama that that was the case. So you didn't have the same moral impact. Had that scene been portrayed as lie down and open your legs, okay. it would absolutely have had exactly the same impact as we saw with Fred not being able to strangle Hop. Okay, fair enough. Um, how many of you would be actually happy to have sex with a robot? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think, I think you're all too, too shy to, I don't know. Uh, I mean, personally, I would go for a human every time. But Can I ask another question? Sure. <laughs> How many of you consider it infidelity to have sex with a robot? Now, that's interesting. Very few. Surprisingly few. But I'm with you. I mean, I watched that and I said, you know, come on, you know, this is masturbation with a large doll. Um, but I'm the fancy hammer school. Here you go. I would. Okay. And I'll move out of your way. Now, trust me, this hair and even that will work. Yeah, sure, just. Um, I won't play it immediately, but. <clears throat> I just click that one. Okay, with the arrow with this one. Okay. Gosh, well, thanks, Bill. That's um, quite a challenge. I don't think I'm going to directly respond to that, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw something else into the pool, um, and I'm going to focus on the body. Um, so my interest is in how it is that we come to share something that is deeply tacit. Um, uh, the, the, the idea of tacit has been around for a few decades. It was coined Polanyi coined the phrase the tacit dimension. Um, and it was, a, it, was an, it was an interesting concept because it sought to collapse the separation between body and mind. And um, spoke about that we know more than we can tell, referring to even the very um, neural processes. So if we perceive something, our brain is functioning. But we can't look inside and see that our brain is functioning, and yet we can see the world by drawing a by the fact that we have this kind of tacit awareness. Um, much of the discussion on tacit knowing dealt with our relationship with technology. Um, early discussion around developing artificial intelligence systems, expert systems, it was all about how do we extract knowledge um, about ourselves and place it into a machine represented in a form which can then be used and then we engage with it. Um, Gosh, I think I'm going to get away from this. I'm just going to speak. Um, I found myself interested in two questions around the tacit. One occurred when people were using expert systems quite early on. Um, and that was that when we engage with something which is an explicit representation of ourselves, our knowledge, it could be mathematical knowledge, it could be um, you know, a banker doing their work. Um, once you create a system, an expert system, which is outside of their experience, and then they use that, why is it that over a period of time they begin to lose the confidence in their own doubt, which enables them to make judgments with trust? Doubt is something that has become something that's almost a negative thing. Um, and that is one question. So why is it when we engage with the representation of ourselves, do we lose confidence in that which is, um, which, which we draw upon and say that we make a judgment with trust? And um, the other interesting problem I'm interested in is the mediation of technology. Um, what is it about being distributed in space 
that makes it difficult for us to share something tacit? How can we share a sense of something being beautiful? How do we make an aesthetic judgment? Um, we see now people can have personas which are not their true self. Um, we can pretend to be things. Um, there's lots of things that are made possible now in the way in which we relate to technology, which because we're not sharing the same physical space, um, raises questions about the ethics of our behavior and uh, about how we're perceiving each other. Um, so I'm interested in these kinds of issues. Um, and I explore what is it about being in the same physical space that enables us to share something that we can't when we're distributed. I'm just going to show you some video clips. Um, this is of some landscape architects, and it's an interesting, interesting problem. This was a company that was downsizing. Um, it was putting technology into all its working practices. So where before they may have used a light table to draw together, to draw contours of a map, now there was one person sitting in front of a computer screen. Um, where before they may have shared a discussion about aerial drawings or um, stuff, now a lot of stuff was being done by computers. So a lot of the manual tasks were being replaced. Um, so you couldn't just wander in and join in an activity. You could walk past and you could see that somebody is doing something, but you couldn't physically engage with them. In the case of this firm, because they were downsizing so much, they couldn't have senior architects in all their bases. So they had a junior architect in one base and they had to put in a bid. They had three weeks before submitting the bid. They asked this junior architect to color in some maps. He did what he was told. He had examples of maps. He followed his instructions. He was given codes. He sent the maps back and the colors were completely wrong. And the architects were horrified and said that he had to come and recolor everything with them. And I asked them that imagine you could have your ultimate dream, seamless technology. Wouldn't that work? Wouldn't that um, achieve the objective of passing on this tacit skill of being able to see as they see? And they said, no, he has to be in the same physical space. So I'm going to show this short video clip. It's of two, two architects sketching. And um, they have been in disagreement. Um, they haven't been able to understand each other f or, um, for a period of about three and a half minutes. This is a moment when they finally do. Up until this moment, when one person has made a proposal, the other one has stood back. Um, what we have here is a senior architect and a junior architect. This moment is when they move in simultaneous synchrony. And in that moment, they can hear each other, making alternative projects, but able to, see, able to acknowledge the other. Um, and I'm very interested in what it is that we can do when we share the space in hearing the other person's <coughs> difference from ourselves without feeling that it in any way, that we don't judge that negatively. Oh, sorry. How am I doing for time? Because I think I'm running. OK. okay. But looking at it from a very practical point of view, People get out, of, get out of the car here. Mm. How do you get to the office? Do you walk? Do you go through here, uh, and then we've got to leave some gaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, is this so what was very interesting is that this um, um, this architect has moved down into the physical space that the other one was trying to speak in um, for a long time. <laughs> As, as he does so, the junior architect bends down. As he touches the surface, the senior architect's finger moves, and he's talking. As he does so, the junior architect moves his hand across in one stroke. Um, and as he moves across, he follows over, and he acknowledges it with one stroke. For me, this is quite magical. I, I obsess about this example because it is... Um, um, it's a very, very powerful moment of um, being... Um, we often assume that when we're moving together that we're doing the same thing. A lot of people, when they talk about gesture or interaction, assume mimicry, assume sameness. What I'm deeply interested in is how do we share differences. Um, and I think that when we look at the body, it, it reveals to us how we can achieve this. Um, um, and these rhythms, these rhythms that w it's in simultaneous 
rhythm. I work with musicians because I'm interested in the function of rhythm and the flow of information, the sharing of ideas. Hi. Uh, yeah, sure. Looking at it from a very practical point of view, people get out of, get, get out of a car here. here. How do you get to the office? Right, now he's held, go, holding it. He comes in, now he uh, starts moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is this so it's very, very short, and I find that all, all these rhythms where we are able to come to understanding, they lie within a w window of 1.5 seconds. And in music, we know that we anticipate a beat in 1.5 seconds. If we go beyond that, we have difficulty to anticipate the other person. Um, so I'm really fascinated by all of these interesting rhythms that occur and the kinds of information. Um, it will relate eventually to the business about robots. Um, now, if you, um, if you try to block these rhythms, then this can happen. This was with a smart board. I got people to do sketching exercises, and it's very interesting. Uh, I just showed the example. So, oh, do I address your Oh, my Whoa. God. Um, I'm not here so much interested in the technology, but simply in testing out this business of what function does rhythm play in, in connecting us at a level that is tacit. And um, this was just nice because the smart board only allowed one touch at a time. And so if two people tried to touch it, it messed up the drawing. So it was lovely. What I found interesting was that just because both people could not move in simultaneous synchrony um, at the surface at any time, it forced the entire interaction to be very strict turn-taking. Yeah, that's really, it doesn't allow for flow. Right. It doesn't allow for flow. And, um, and here, what's, what's very interesting is that it's not unnatural for people to be put into that situation. So they forget they can't do it. So when he, when he moves and allows the other person to come in, he moves back in and he completely forgets. So that was lovely. And when I, um, it was interesting that the students, I then got them to draw on a normal whiteboard, and they were so happy. They were breathing, they were able to move around all over the space, engage, touch, whatever. They just felt so free. And uh, a short while after this little experiment was done, somebody came from IBM and was promoting a blue board, and these students stood up and went, uh, no. <laughs> it was being promoted for collaboration for children, and students went, no, 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 not at all. And this is um, another... Um, the moment of, in, in every culture, we have the human greeting. It's a moment of simultaneous synchrony. And it's not accidental that wherever you are in the world, you greet. If, this, if the synchrony isn't quite right, and the greeting is awkward, you feel a little bit uncomfortable. And it takes a while to regain it in the interaction. Sometimes you can even make a judgment about a person if a handshake isn't quite right. So I got people to walk into a room without telling them why, just to see what they would do. And my hypothesis was that if they share the same culture, they are likely to synchronize towards each other and co-adapt so that they stop at the same time. This was just, just for fun. But anyway, I'll show you. Oh, 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 sorry, lost it. Uh, I'll go on the side. And this was quite consistent. Um, even if you got them to walk into rooms in different angles, you find that they would actually move their bodies around and one person would then juggle their feet so that they stop at the same time. Um, one Austrian sneaked into our um, experiment where I, had only, I only wanted to have English subjects who'd been to school in this country. Um, and he sneaked in and he strode into the room and he didn't, he didn't co-adapt at all, waited, and then the English person slowly strolled up and reached him. So, um, uh, got into the radar, but... Um, so, I'm interested in how it is that um, 
it's tacit knowledge is about a collective act across people's bodies and voices. It's not about an individual moving with another, uh, an individual communicating with another individual. I'm interested in these moments of collective action because I think that is where you come to see as another person sees. You come to sense what another person is. But I want to avoid the idea that you can presume to know what another person is thinking. Um, um, Edward T. Hall speaks about identity transference. And this gets quite interesting when it comes to thinking about our relation to artificial, the artificial. Um, we have this idea of su intersubjectivity, which permeates a lot of discourse, um, assuming that this is a very positive thing. But it can mean that we judge another person from our own self. So if the person doesn't behave as we expect them to behave, then we may assume that there's something wrong with that person rather than with ourselves. And one of the things he says is that we need to be conscious about our own assumptions, cultural assumptions and otherwise, in order to avoid making this identity transference. And there's been some beautiful work done by an anthropologist working with the Korowai in Papua. And they have a completely different model of interaction where they are constantly monitoring their relation, their sociality, according to their difference between themselves and the other. And they never say that they can know what another person is thinking. And I find that is a really challenging thing, asking us to reappraise maybe how we think about the way in which we connect with each other. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thanks. What's interesting, one of the things that's interesting about that to me is that at the annual re-robot conference, which is robots law and policy, it's trying to look ahead to see where the legal conflicts are going to be, trying to avoid 25 years of the same battles like we've had over the internet. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot is anthropomorphization. You know, the, the problem that people look at something synthetic and they see in it what they want to see. And, and that's actually kind of how I felt about your reaction to that, which is, that, that you identified maybe with the, with the robot and imagined it feeling terribly upset. And it felt terribly upset. It was. In the fi I know, I know it was fiction. I know. We it, had this discussion. We had this within discussion. Within the fiction. Yes. It, Anna Karenina didn't exist. She still upsets me. You know she's dead, right? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even read Anna Karenina and I know how she died. Um, Zinwe, you are up. He, you okay? You want to go first? All right, Martin. We're okay. We're a, a quick shift. Uh, Martin Smith, who is it is Smith. Yes. Yes. Uh, memory, you know, um, is well. He's going to talk about robots. He was supposed to bring a robot. How do you know he'd do this? <laughs> How do I know he didn't send a robot in his place? <laughs> a very difficult question. I thought I might depart from my beautifully prepared script for a second because uh, Bill mentioned humans. That was a TV program that was brought in fairly recently and the advertising agency who wanted to promote it uh, asked me to write an essay on the future of robots over the next 50 years and uh, paid me quite a lot of money to do that, and I did it, and I was very pleased, and they paid me. What they didn't tell me was they were going to put it in every newspaper in the UK, uh, Times, Telegraph, Guardian, the lot. What they also didn't tell me was they did a survey uh, um, asking 2,000 people, I think, what they thought of various questions about robots. Buried in those 100 questions was one question, which was, would you have sex with a robot? Surprise, surprise, all the newspapers put that as their headline, even though it was one question out of a hundred. And 17% uh, of Brits admitted that they would have sex with a robot. Far more, I noticed, than the audience. So somebody here is probably not being quite so frank as they were in an anonymous survey. <laughs> the, uh, the end result was I was inundated with um, journalists from America who were, <laughs> who were totally convinced that Brits were completely mad because 17% of Brits would have sex with a robot, which would prove their greatest suspe suspicions. So if you're a, 
accosted by an American journalist saying, you're slightly mad, it's probably my fault. Hang on, is a vibrator a robot? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a very good vibrator there, just, um, uh, no, because it doesn't have any uh, intelligence. So for me, to be a robot, uh, it needs to have some inputs, uh, some outputs, and some intelligence in between. So for example, humans have five inputs, uh, sound, sight, touch, taste, smell. Uh, robots can have very, very many more. Robots can have sensors that uh, don't exist in nature. Laser, radar, GPS, uh, well over 20 or 30 sensors a robot can have that humans can't have. The other advantage robots have is, of course, any signal inside a robot travels at about half the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. Um, the speed of nerves down your nerve cells is about 100 meters a second. Or if so, for the robot has uh, something like a three million times speed advantage over humans. The other advantage that robots have, of course, is they can have uh, oh, uh, pneumatics, hydraulics, solenoids, electric motors, and we poor humans have stuck with one actuator alone, which is a muscles. Uh, m many, many of them, but uh, it's only one, one type. <coughs> that doesn't mean we can't augment them, though. Uh, that is true, yes. You can make yourself partly robotic, should you wish to do so. And, uh, in fact, many people are. Uh, something like one in 17 UK people over 75 already have um, uh, artificial hearts or artificial pacemakers or the artificial hormones. Uh, it's a very, very large number. So we are getting closer to robots as robots get closer to us. Um, another point I was thinking of making with the uh, Bill's bit of video, the, um, the robot or synth uh, brought up the um, philosophical concept of free will. Uh, which I think is very interesting because I think we have to believe in free will because, of course, we have no choice. <laughs> so we have to be very careful as academics. We tend to be put into a position of not knowing what we're going to say next with journalists. Uh, many of these journalists have got me to quote things and I've said things and the journalist has reported them. They change the words very slightly, me, even inverting what I actually meant, uh, it usually makes what I said much more interesting, but it's not what I said. And that's quite common um, with academics and journalists. Gen academics have to be extremely careful not to be uh, misled. Um, oh dear, member of the National... <laughs> so, so, Bill is big... <laughs> I might say I'm outnumbered, so I'll stop there. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, I, what we're going to see is clearly um, a very, very rapid evolution. Uh, it's taken four billion years for us to get from bacteria to where we are now. That's from a single cell. There are around about 200 different types of cell in a human being. Uh, and each of those cells has roughly a thousand times much DNA in it uh, as a bacterium. So in round numbers as a starting point, we're about 250,000 times as complex as a bacterium but we'd work on the same letters, the same sentences, the same language as bacterium. We like to think of ourselves as very, very special, but we share 15% of our DNA with bacteria, 75% with mice, and about 90%, 98% with chimpanzees. We love to think of us being super different, but we're not. We are not the center of the universe. The heart is just a pump, and we are just very clever bacteria. In fact, we're robots in a way, because if you take your uh, history back generation after generation, great grandparents, grandchildren, going back hundreds of generations to the beginning of the tree, the evolutionary tree, what you find is a bacterium which has very, no brains, very few sensors, very few outputs. You could describe them as mindless robots, and we're defended, descended from them. So, am I anywhere near? My, my time. 
I think maybe having offended a couple of journalists, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I would just say I'm a little more of um, a biological supremacist, much more so than I might have said, implied, in that, um, yes, uh, robots will be able to far outstrip us, probably, in intelligence, in its ability, and uh, so forth. But it won't have gone through those billions of years of evolution, fighting for food, fighting for territory, fighting for sex. All that kind of stuff is part of our evolution. Robots won't have that, so they'll always be different. Actually, I, I do have a question for you, which is not the one I told you about. Um, but you said in a, in a piece that I saw in the Telegraph, Something about we shouldn't slow down innovation, and you made the comparison to having men with flags walking in front of cars. Now, um, I want to know why we shouldn't slow down innovation. I mean, there, it's arguable, for example, the car being a good example. If we had thought longer about the car, we might have decided it was going to burn up the planet and was a bad idea. So why shouldn't we slow down innovation? Why shouldn't we be thinking? Well, um who decides uh, what to slow down and by who much, by how much, sorry. No. Um, the trouble is you have a sort of uh, world government type thing and of course we know politicians have our interests at heart and that they are faultless in their decision making. Um, so I think I would not quite totally trust a politician to decide what would do it. Uh, the free market has its problems but um, you, you have the ability now, if you, if you wanted to say tomorrow, we are not going to have diesel cars in London or you're, we're not going to just have electric cars or something, you can, once you've found the problems, take moderate steps to ameliorate the difficulties. Okay. I'm glad to hear that as Nick Postrum uh, predicted, we're not going to have a planet filled with nothing but paper clips. Um, and Zinwei Sha. Thank you. Um, so how many of you have uh, played with small children in your lives, small, like three-year-olds, four-year-olds? Okay, we have all been that, sorry. So how many of you, when you play with a small child, have done something like this? Hi, this is Bunny Rabbit, and da 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 And you start playing, and you tickle the kid, right? And the child laughs and giggles like crazy, right? And we've all played pretend. You can do that with a sock, you can do it with a hand. So this thing about playing pretend, or in Wittgenstein, seeing as, right, is something that we do. So I would say that if we want to talk about robots and AI, maybe we can think about something different, which is just this thing about playing pretend. How is it, maybe a different question could be, how is it that we can pretend? It's maybe a richer question than saying how a robot could be human. It's actually the same question, right? To ascribe humanity to something. Well, we do that already. We do it with socks, we do it with hands, we do it with toys. We all do that. So, I'm going to talk about signs, entities like that, like squiggles and puppets. Then I'll talk about the stuff of which these signs are made. Okay? I'll talk about robots because we were asked to, but I'll also talk about the stuff of which robots are made. And then maybe there's Q&A and I'll say, well, what do we do about stuff? But I won't, talk, I won't do that formally, you can ask me. So here's a sign, okay, a clown's face. Why is this face terrifying? No, question, it's not rhetorical, why? In general, even if it was just a, just a clown before film, clowns in circus, right? The sad clown is a trope. Why? Why? The clown's painted to be smiling, no matter what he feels. The, the, the sign, that is the smile, has nothing to do with what he's feeling. That's the tragedy of the clown, right? Well, I'd say it's partially over exaggeration, self-covering itself, sort of putting a lot of it. Yeah. 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 So you look at this, that's why I say, quote, smile. That is the sign of the smile. The upward curve is not a smile. And then a moment later, he is smiling, but that he's not happy. Okay, so even if you have the observable, that is the skin is curling up in the right way, and he might even be doing all the physiology of smiling, still you're terrified or he's terrified. Okay, 
So that's why even smiles doesn't, doesn't mean that this is happy. So there's a disconnect. My point is that there's a disconnect between what you can observe and the experience, the experience of this person. There's a difference here. This is known in film, called the Kuleshev effect. Kuleshev, anybody from film, film studies? Okay, well known. Basically, uh, I have a simple example of this. You show a clip, you show segments. This is the beginning of film, montage. Uh, one example would be you show a woman's face or a man's face, you show in a full plate of food, and you show the same face again. Second version, you show the man's face, person's face, you show empty plate, just crumbs, you show the face again. Okay? You ask the person, what is she or he feeling? First case, person's, you make up something. Second case, person's sad, there's no food. Okay, these are different examples of montages, sequences. You have the same faces appearing, plate of food, a, a corpse, a naked woman, etc. Same face. If you present these clips, the viewers say, ascribe completely different interpretations of what this person's feeling. Okay, Kulish effect. So, I won't put too many words on, okay? But I think it's more useful to think about things not the same rather than things being the same. It's actually helped to break up a few assumptions. Experience is not thought, not the same thing. The things that we can feel that we may not be thinking, just walking down the street. Thought is more than language. This is Centinder's book. Please go read it. Okay? There's more that we can, more that we think that, than we can put into words. Musicians, how many musicians there are in the room? People who play analog, analog, machine, analog instruments. Finger memory, right? You learn, you learn, you learn. You can, some of you might read musical scores, but at some point, you stop thinking about it. You just play. It's all in the fingers. Same thing with athletics. All right? Now, here's another example of, cognition, of uh, this kind of thing. This is a cl more clear example of the Kuleshov effect object. Here on the right-hand side, here's a whole bunch of signs. Okay? They're just squiggles, unless you know Chinese. They're just squiggles. I, I did a little joke. Tian and Tian, these are two words which sound pretty much the same, unless you, you can hear the, hear the difference in tone but they're completely different words in stroke and completely different meanings, right? And then down below, I made a little pun, okay? Tian, the, the middle character, is this word for field, oh, right, rice patties. When you learn Chinese, you say, oh, it's like rice patties, but it could be also windows in a house, right? So it's nothing in the sign that'll tell you what it means, nothing. And by sign, it could be also the, the curve of the man's face, right, or anything that a sensor can detect anything. Temperature, body, motion of the fingers, whatever. So what I'm trying to point out here is that there's a really radical break between the thing that you can observe and the actual experience. Complete break. Okay, we've had 100 years of this kind of thinking. Now, let's look at the stuff of which signs are made. Here's a video, some research we did about 10 years ago. There's something about this, it's, the smoke is synthetic, okay? The Yoichiro Serita from Sony was doing this work. It's just motion turns into optical flow, optical flow is rendered as density, and then at a moment you can see he picks up his mouse, which is a laser mouse, with a bit of red on it. I hope it shows in slight. This is all, okay, we're, we're synthesizing, we're taking motion and we're treating the motion as if it were dust, we model the dust with equations, we move the dust as if it's, um, as if it's a physical quantity, physical stuff, like smoke, okay? So we do this a couple of times. I hope it's gonna show, but then it's gonna show something that you don't have with real smoke. He picks up the mouse, there. Look what he does, he's gonna rub it with his finger. Think, if you have a real finger, real light, you put your finger on top of the light, what happens to the light? If you put your finger in front of the light, what happens to the light? It, it darkens, it gets dark. But because he's rubbing it, you see the red sort of spreads apart? Light doesn't work like that. You put your, light, your hand in front of the light, it blocks the light. Real light would never behave like this. So this is magic. This is why we use computational media in my lab because we can do magic, it's kind of alchemy. Real light doesn't work like dust, yet by moving the fingers like this across light, you can smear the light and make it blow apart. This is the kind of research talking about the stuff of which signs are made. Okay, 
I'm going to go to robots. Let's skip this part. Robots. This is one of the earliest lines, okay? Anybody know the story of the mechanical charge from 1728 or so? Okay. Sorry, I'm not going to be pedagogical. I'll just tell the story. I know people know, so many people know the story. Okay, so this was a chess playing machine, an automaton, back in the days, 18th century, when automatons were very popular, okay? They still are, they're called robots. So it went around, it could beat the pants off of most people, beat the, hmm, whatever, shoes off most people they could meet in the courts of Europe. After the original owner died, they discovered the way this thing worked, this automaton worked, was because they cheated. Inside was a dwarf, a small person who could play chess very well. So, so this, I, I claim, is not different than what we do today in this kind of discussion as tonight. We're still proxying, we pro proxy ourselves into the computer. We want to see little homunculi, you know, little mini-me's inside the computer. And this somehow is a debate which I think we could maybe explode. Doesn't have to go there. Here's a robot. Very familiar. This is a robot, okay? ATM machine. But if you look inside the robot, this is what's inside it. This is a, like a flow diagram uh, or specification of the code behind a banking system, okay? Not very sexy, but this is logic. But this logic is not the logic that, let's say, a bank clerk would be using to decide whether she or he would give you some cash back, okay? But behind, this is just, however, programming, behind that, is much bigger part of the robot. This is the robot that's interesting. So behind the little machine in front of you is this machine. This is the international banking system. Just take a look, okay? This is a huge robotic system. Now this, I think, is where it begins to get interesting. I make a pitch for AI and society, all right? This is where real autonomous systems are, right here. This is an autonomous system or a semi-autonomous system because there are humans all over this system. Inside this system, they're cooperating with the logic, sitting right next to them. This is where we should be talking about, okay? So this is an example, what I th when I think about robots, I think of the stuff of which robots are made. It's made of cash, of laws, of networks, of institutions, banks, etc. That's all part of the so-called semi-autonomous system that engineers talk about with bankers. Question, do we want to live in a world where it's so incredibly intricate that they can't make changes in any one small part because to make a change in a small part, you have to change the entire world. This is the big dilemma that we're in today, okay? Because these robots are not standalone, as we see in science fiction, they actually are inside this vast web of interconnected parts, logic, people, flesh, laws. It's, they're not human at all. They've never been human. This is robotics right here. So, I'll finish with that picture, but I say there's something that we can do, all right, which I won't show pictures now because I, I will leave it for discussion. But a lot of this has to do with thinking about how can we actually give wriggle room to ourselves, play, room to play with all the stuff of which robots and science are made. Thank you. You know, what you're talking about, you change something small and you can change the big w world at the same time. It sounds like we've implemented, s without intending to, a real-time butterfly effect. Do you, do, you, do you remember the butterfly effect? Yeah. Uh, anybody know the story of the gear, the gear, the gear world? The gears. Okay. Uh, uh, so the, this is um, Brian Smith, I think. Brian Cantwell Smith, I think, who told me this story. Um, uh, we think, as engineers, we want to make everything work, so we make everything work, so we make them put in, put in gears, right? If you do this procedure, then this other person does that procedure. I want to apply for a visa for London, for England. I, here are the steps you have to follow, bureaucracy, right? But a good bureaucracy, a German one, right? When all the gears would be fit carefully together, and if you, if you turn this wheel, then all the right other wheels would turn. Now, imagine in a perfect world, the gear world, all these parts are connected together, everything. Interpol, FBI, Homeland, everything. Everything's connected together, as it is, right? But, what, think what happens. How much energy does it take to turn this local gear? How much energy? It's a lot. In fact, it's unbounded. Because to turn this local gear here, just to change where my daughter is gonna go to school, means that 
all the other wheels had to turn. And you've had experience with this, right? If you ever have to go to a different country and register a child for those born there, et cetera, et cetera. So that means the more perfect, in the sense, the more interconnected everything is in this robotic system, then the amount of energy it takes to make any change in the system goes up to infinity. Uh, so the butterfly doesn't, doesn't act, so, so stepping on a butterfly doesn't actually, do you remember the butterfly? Even if it's unpredictable, none of us, I'm saying something else. I'm saying that the butterfly is about unpredictability and determinism and the unpredictability of deterministic system. I'm saying that even if we had a perfect deterministic system, the amount of energy you need to change is unbounded. Sorry, you have a question, a comment. Compare this with the water, the river, the stream. Okay, this is a very nice way to think of it. There's gear, how come nature isn't like this? I mean, you can put your finger in the water and just go like this and stir, and it just works. You, all of you can put your fingers in the this, in this stream and stir, and it just works, it doesn't break. So it's interesting to, to contrast the situation.